morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Burke Britain Quarantine TV. So another special guest this week. So uh, Jay and I are joined by Will McKenzie, which probably a lot of you have met over his time, director at Achieve Home Loans. So uh, whenever we need any financing help, any refinancing new stuff, uh, plenty of first home buyers, we usually direct them Will's way and he's been a big part of our business for a long time. So if you haven't put a face to the name, good chance to do so. Uh, obviously, at the moment, Will just sort of said it to us before, a lot of people have a lot of time on their hands in isolation. So looking over your debt and sort of seeing where that's situated is a bit topical at the moment. So today we'll just sort of talk generally about a few opportunities and options and, and more just, just talking about anything that sort of is, is um, an opportunity for anyone that, that Will or Jay or I've come across. So everyone's a bit different with their debt and debt's a bit of a dirty word at times, but it, it can be a big opportunity for people, especially with low interest rates. So, uh, um, Jay, did you want to kick off with any topics that you're sort of... Yeah, to but Will? firstly, just to say thanks. Uh, thanks, Will, for joining us. Uh, actually, where are we? Can you guys... My pleasure. There you go. um, thanks for joining us, Will. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know we have a lot of discussions offline, but it's probably nice to bring those discussions online and share them uh, with people. Okay. Where, where are you joining us from? Just quickly, Will, where are you today? I'm in my home office at a beautiful downtown Wellington today where it's about <laughs> eight degrees and uh, not very pleasant at all, I can tell you. But uh, hopefully you can't, the heater going flat out in the background is not too noisy. <laughs> uh, it's all good, mate. It's all good. So like further to Ben's point, I mean, we are in a fairly unique time in history where, you know, we've got interest rates at historical lows. We're in the middle of a, sort of a global pandemic, which for a lot of reasons is putting some um, focus on banks, but also on people's individual cash flow positions. So it's, it's, probably, um, it's probably not the thing that's foremost in people's mind to think about actually how they can benefit from their debt position or how they can improve their debt position um, in this current climate. But as Ben alluded to, there certainly are opportunities in this market and this time to actually take advantage of what are some pretty good opportunities. Obviously, it's dependent on people's individual circumstances, but um, we talked about a couple of things. But one, I suppose, well, firstly, let's just talk a, a little bit about the fact that we are in sort of one of the lowest interest rates environment of all time. And probably, depending on circumstances, a great time to be reviewing people's debt position and trying to improve that, put a bit of pressure on your lender or actually shop it around. Certainly, and I think generally in the hubbub of life, people sometimes are too busy and uh, they just go along with the flow with what they've got and think, oh, that's good, we've set that up, and now we forget about it and just get on with life. Um, the reality is if you're prepared to spend a little bit of time and, and have a look at your debt situation, as you rightly say, at the moment, there's certainly some great opportunities out there. Um, and in a very, very low interest rate environment. And my crystal ball tells me that we're gonna be in that environment for some time to come. I can't see rates going north anytime soon. Um, so it is a great opportunity to look at what you've got at the moment, uh, what you have been offered from your existing lender, um, to uh, have a go at them and see if they can improve on what they've got uh, for you, or to shop around and see what else might be available in the marketplace. Um, you don't necessarily have to leave your existing bank to improve your situation. Uh, we can help you with looking out for, for better and, and more cost-effective product. Um, so there's, there's plenty of opportunities out there and there's probably no better time than now to look at doing that for a whole host of reasons. And we can go through some of those as, as we talk. But um, particularly in your uh, situation with your business, um, you know, it's a situation where people could perhaps borrow funds. They would have what I would term lazy equity tied up in their home. Um, it's not earning them anything. Um, they could borrow against that equity at 2 or 3%, something like that today. Um, and you fellows are that good. I'm sure you could earn them more than that in the marketplace. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they could put that lazy equity to use and to work for them to improve their overall wealth over a longer period of time. I suppose on the back of that, Will, and that is a massive opportunity. A lot of people uh, ex have explored it. A lot of people haven't. A lot of people hear the words and terminology around it. So equity and redraw and, and, you know, getting into these things that 
it can get a little bit confusing. So the key being whenever we're looking at it is to use professionals. So, you know, you, you doing the, the equity side and getting that access to the equity in the best way possible and then seeking advice about how to invest it. You don't want to get access to that equity that you've built up in your home to, to go on big holidays or buy new cars, which sometimes it's a necessity to do those things in terms of new vehicles, et cetera. But we want to be using that equity for investment purposes where possible. So that's that's where you need to be getting advice to make sure. And I know having worked with Will a lot about where we secure debt, so getting the best rate because of what underlies and where it's secured against is a, is a massive part of that. So um, probably on the flip side, sort of going back the other way is that a lot of people have some bad debts as well, and they, but they also have some good equity in their home so they can look at potential to, to refinance and, and consolidate some debt, which is, which is a massive benefit for, for cash flow at these times with a lot of people um, you know, struggling. So I suppose, Will, you could have come across some pretty scary credit card debts over the years. Uh, is that something you're seeing a bit of or you probably think you should be seeing more of that debt consolidation stuff? Well, the, the, certainly we see a lot of it. And, you know, people are, are amazed when we sit them down and say, OK, what are your outgoings? You're paying X amount on a credit card. People generally have more than one of those these days. Um, so there's money going out, credit cards, they might have a car loan, personal loan, the mortgage, add it all up, and there's thousands of dollars per month going out. We roll it all into one in what we call consolidate it, which is just a fancy word for rolling everything into one big ball. Uh, borrow that against the home at the lower interest rates and the repayments come down and improves their cash flow markedly. Yeah, and then that cash flow opportunity allows them to either pay down that debt a bit quicker without huge interest rates or redirect that. And for some people, and this is where it's situational, you need to be getting advice is that that might be for putting food on the table. It might be for, for paying down that extra debt. It might be for other investment purposes or super contributions or whatever that may be but you need to get that it's it's personal for different and different for everyone yeah I think that, yeah sorry I was just gonna say I think the structure of debt you know, sometimes we think of debt uh, you know people getting a home loan uh, as, a, as a pretty reasonably simple process but the structure is critical the structure of how those funds are used and what they're used for and to your point Ben um, of then working with that improved cash flow to maybe help reduce debt quicker, not just defer it over, you know, 30 years, but actually free up that cash flow to, to reduce it quicker. I mean, I, sort of on an aside, but I was thinking about a couple of client scenarios um, recently where, you know, most people, their biggest asset is in most instances, their home. And it's also probably the asset that they have least access to in terms of liquidity, you know, the ability to get a hold of, you know, it's pretty hard to sell the bathroom if you need a bit of uh, a bit of extra cash flow. And I remember having some conversations with clients talking about this biggest asset that they have and having the potential to actually have access to the equity in it, not necessarily to use it. And sometimes the question of what do we use that equity for, it's an unknown. But I had this situation recently where I had a client where uh, probably 12, 18 months ago, it suggested that maybe it's worth looking at having access to the, the equity in their home. What for? I said, don't know. We might have a uh, need for emergency funding. It could be for, for cash flow reasons. Um, the problem being now that some people are in a position where uh, their own cash flow is dried up, their own ability to actually access the equity in their home is dried up. And so, you sort of never know what the future is going to hold. So I always think that if there is the potential to actually review your home loan sooner rather than later and make sure that the structure of that loan, either the interest rate, the repayments or the access to the equity is there. So you've got maybe some emergency funding fallback position. Maybe you've got some access for investment opportunities, which is probably one of the most um, relevant discussion points when we talk about debt and investment at the moment. Well, we're in a situation where interest rates are at historical lows, borrowing is cheap, and the market is also uh, we're in a we're in a bear market situation, um, and and sort of investment opportunities are prevalent. So. I always say that it's one of those things that you can keep sort of kicking that can down the road and say, well, I'll review that next week, next month, next year. And it's generally not a problem until it's a problem. Would you agree with that, Will? And you're right about setting up, and we call it a rainy day buffer. Uh, in other words, having access to that equity, 
uh, in your home, in an emergency, or for whatever need at any time. And it's, uh, it's no good waiting until there is an emergency to try and access it. You're better off to have the facility set up, they're ready to go. Um, and uh, there's no better time to demonstrate that than right now. A lot of people, their cash flow has, has been decimated um, and they need something to live on. Um, and if they've got that facility already set up and we call it a rainy day buffer, for them, it's currently raining very heavily. So I think they that can the that is good. All those funds and access things now, whereas if they had to go and ask for a loan now and they've got no income coming in, banks would probably say, no, we don't want to know you. Mm. Um, so you're better off to have things set up. If you never use them, provided it's structured correctly in the first place and set up with the right lender, it doesn't cost you a boon if you don't use it. Yep. To have it there um, as a comfort factor is just good business sense in my opinion. That was what I was just going to say, you, you touched on it, is that if you don't use it, it doesn't cost you. And I think that's sometimes what people fear. They think that setting up a facility, that they're going to be paying interest on a, on a loan. But if you never draw down the loan, there's no interest. So just having that ex access set up and sitting there, it's not costing you anything along the way if you've got it structured correctly. So you're not paying interest on money you haven't drawn down. So that I think people is a bit of a misconception for some people around that, that as soon as you set these facilities up, that there'll be a cost. If you don't use it, it doesn't cost you. I think, yeah. the, key, I think the, key point, the key point there is that it has to be structured correctly. I mean, that, yeah. that's the key point in that phrase is that it has to be structured correctly because if it's structured incorrectly, you know, it, it, can, it can cause some issues. But if it's structured correctly with advice from the financial planning side of things and the structure from the debt side of things uh, that, you know, that we experience with Will, you can have a fantastic outcome. So I think that's probably the critical point. You're spot on there, Jay, and, and depending on what you use those funds for down the track, if you, you do use them for investment, um, the, the costs and things associated with the interest, et cetera, can be claimable for you. So it is essential that it's structured correctly in the first place. Yeah. So that you can take advantage of those benefits if and when they arise. I think maybe just jumping to a bit of a, a side topic here, but um, something that I've dealt with a lot um, and Jay, you as well, and Will, of course, but first home buyers, and, and I think through this period, they don't need to, to fear too much that getting it, getting everything in place and setting up your approvals, there might be opportunities in the market and don't feel that, you know, they need to run scared. You set the approvals up and sit there with that available that when, if any options arise for them, that, you know, they might be able to jump in and make the most of this as well and get into a, a get in when rates are at a, a low point uh, and really be in a, in a great position. So I think I'm still seeing first home buyers get a little bit shaky just because of uncertainty. Um, keep coming through and keep getting assessed and, and see what your borrowing capacity is, but also making sure that we're working all together to make sure you're not borrowing beyond your means as well, because the risk being with the rates being extremely low is that you get comfortable in those positions. So we just sort of, you know, it, it all gets rolled into one. There's a lot that goes into that, but um, first home buyers, I don't think they need to be running away scared. The banks are still lending. I know you, we sort of touched on before we jumped on, Will, there's a little bit of apprehension from some of them, but I just want you to sort of reassure people that they're still lending to people that have got the income to show for what they're, what they're doing. Certainly for, for good people in a good position, there'll always be funding available. Um, and uh, for first home buyers in particular, um, buying your first home really is like walking through a minefield. Um, there's so many uh, pit, pitfalls and challenges and things, um, but you don't need to be frightened of it if you've got someone who's been through it all before and can lead you through, know, knows where the bombs are and knows what to dodge, um, but can lead you through to the other end. And I think it is uh, vitally important to seek a pre-approval so that you know um, what your borrowing capacity is and then you can go out and shop with confidence knowing that, all right, I can look in this particular price range or that particular price range. No good falling in love with a place for 700000 if you can only afford four hundred, and mm -hmm. vice versa. It's no good looking for two hundred if you could have bought something for four hundred. Yeah. Um, Will, can you just, could, could you just touch on that pre-approval, just for the sort of uninitiated, what pre-approval actually means? So what, what you look to do when it comes to pre-approval yeah. to understand what something, yeah. someone's borrowing capacity yeah. is? Well, well there's, there, there are pre-approvals and there are pre-approvals. You can walk into a bank and give them your, your name and your income and not much else, and they'll say, oh, yes, we'll pre-approve you for X amount of dollars. Um, to be frank with you, they're not worth what they tell you, a lot of them, because 
there are so many subject conditions into that pre-approval. What we do is take it to the next level and basically take people through as though they're applying for a loan right from the through to full formal approval and we get it approved subject simply to satisfactory evaluation on the property that they ultimately buy. So every, every other thing is crossed off and ticked off so there's no other hiccups when it comes to uh, actually settling on the on that particular property. Um, and as I said, you have that in writing um, and it is an approval subject simply to a satisfactory evaluation on the property that you buy. So you can go out and shop with confidence and know that, okay, if I find the right property, I've got X amount of dollars to spend. Um, and you can do that with the confidence of knowing that there shouldn't be any hiccups come the, uh, the formal finance approval for you. I think one, one of the other things, just from personal experience working with you, Will, one of the things I really like about the pre-approval process is that from a planning perspective, we have a picture before we've actually, uh, we have the loan in place of what the person's cash flow position is going to be. And so our ability to actually project forward and see what their situation is going to look like in sort of the real world um, is, uh, is very accurate. And I don't like surprises. I know clients don't like surprises. So it's very nice to be able to project forward and actually see what the world's going to look like in the future. So, you know, I encourage anyone uh, looking at their lending situation, talk to us, talk to us about that pre-approval process of understanding what, uh, what lending is available, um, but also what impact that will have on your cash flow. All of those pieces to the puzzle help you make good decisions about how you actually restructure your debt uh, moving forward, so yeah, yeah. Well, I think that holistic approach that you're talking about is is very important. Um, if we get information from people, income, etc., and we feed it into our computer across a spread of lenders, there'll be all different amounts that a lender will say they'll lend to the to people. Um, and what I say to people, and people quite often ask me, "What's the right amount for me to borrow?" And I say, "Well." It doesn't matter what the banks say they'll lend to you. It's what you can go home at night and put your head on the pillow and go to sleep without worrying about. Uh, that's the right amount for you. And yep. the only way you're going to know that is if you know what you've just touched on, what it's going to pan out to in the future. Yeah. And, and I would think, yeah. Sorry, Ben. Um, I was just going to say, you can have, the thing with, and it's flawed in some senses, is that, you know, that, that walk in the door bank approval is that you can have two situations with the same couple earning the same income but their borrowing capacity can be completely different because one of them has great cash flow and ability to service a loan and the other one isn't even saving. So it, it's, I think it has to be personalised. And I think it's probably, people have uh, probably been a little bit annoyed with the, with the lending system in the last few years because it actually is becoming more and more personalised and getting to that point where they are being a bit more responsible with some of that lending. Yeah, I think for, for a long time, there's been a disparity between what people can afford and what the bank says they can afford. And those two are coming closer and closer together, which although, you know, it might be, might reduce people's ability to borrow, it's probably a more realistic view of what they can actually afford. Um, now, I'm mindful of time. We've been talking for a little while, but it's been all great stuff. One of the things I think on our list of conversations, probably in light of um, what's happening at the moment, maybe with touch on those people that maybe are struggling with their existing loans, um, We've heard people talk about these repayment holidays for on, on, on mortgages. Maybe you want to explain a little bit about that, Will, what it is um, and whether it's good, bad or otherwise, and I suppose very dependent upon people's circumstances, but uh, give it people a little bit more context on what that actually means. It, it does depend on individual circumstances, but generally across the board, what the, the lenders and, and, and all of them are doing this, they will give you a repayment holiday in other words they will defer your repayments now does that mean that the interest stops being charged no that's still ticking away uh, during that period of time and at the end of that repayment holiday they they will do one of a couple of things they will readjust your loan term or they'll readjust your loan repayment so that over time you make up that difference it hasn't been covered while you've been having your repayment holiday so my advice to people is where you can make your payments. If you need that repayment um, holiday, that break, certainly set it up. But if you find you've got some spare change on the way through, there's nothing to stop you putting some extra payments in. So that, that hurt, for want of a better word, at the other end, isn't as great. Um, but again, it's individual circumstances and horses for courses. Um, and, you know, on that basis, 
there are other things to consider. If you, for example, if you've got a heap of credit card debt um, and you're going to have a repayment holiday on your mortgage, use that freed up cash flow to get rid of the credit card debt if you can. That's just one option. There are plenty of others. And again, in individual circumstances, and what I try and do is tailor make things to my client's needs at that particular time and also for into the future. So we, we try and look at and taking a holistic approach against the overall debt situation, not just for today, but for tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and down the track as well. I think that that probably is a, is a really good point that again, and we've touched on this many times, everyone's different. Everyone has their own scenario situation and you can't read uh, you know, an article online and, and, and work out what's the best thing for you because you get someone else's idea and based on someone else's situation. And the key is to talk to us, talk to Will, talk to whoever it is about your own situation that works out whether you, know, you should be looking at investment or you should be looking into how do we get things through for the next six months and then re reevaluate then. So I think that's probably the theme with anything to do with debt is you need to be seeking advice from people that deal with it all the time. Uh, and one, one the, sorry, Will, I was just going to say yeah. one of the most boring parts of financial planning is probably the most important, which is cash flow management. And I talk about it all the time. It's probably the most boring, but it's probably the first thing that people need to get a handle on because every other financial decision they make in their life, whether it be their debt position or their ability to invest, comes back to do they hand, have a handle on their cash flow? Do they understand what comes in and what goes out? People can get a hold of that. It helps with all of the other decisions that we make. It, it, you're right. It is so important. Oh, just one quick example. I had uh, some people in the last couple of weeks came to me and they'd been contemplating buying an investment property. Um, I'll keep it short, but I'll give you the details. They had a mortgage, I think, for about $240,000 on their current property, um, good equity in it, and uh, they wanted to do something to set the kids up for their future with the investment property. Uh, they were paying, I think, about $1,800 and odd dollars per month on their current mortgage. Um, it, it was on a higher interest rate than it should have been, and um, they were making higher payments. Uh, long story short, we were able to set them up to release the equity. Um, they've since purchased an investment property uh, with the rental income that's coming in on that investment property. Their outgoings now have gone from $1,847 a month to $1,873 a month, and yet they've got an additional half a million dollar property in their portfolio. That's just one of the, the types of opportunities that are out there at the moment uh, for people to borrow at cheaper interest rates and invest in property, shares, managed funds, guided by someone like yourself. Thanks, Will. I think it's probably a, that's a probably pretty good way to wrap things up. I know we could talk for hours, mate. I, I know uh, that we've got plenty to talk about and sort of having these general discussions is really helpful for us and hopefully it's really helpful for all those people out there, clients and, and potential clients that uh, that may have a need that we can help them with. I suppose the closing, closing piece of this uh, before we say goodbye is just to remind everyone again, it's so important to seek advice and that anything that you, you know, you hear in these discussions uh, shouldn't be considered advice. It should be taken uh, in context with your own situation and followed up with us personally. So, um, Will, thanks so much, mate, for joining us today, uh, live from Wellington. Uh, ben, thanks again for, uh, for, for organising this chat. Did either of you want to say any closing remarks before I let you go? My pleasure to be with you today. And, Please, for any of your clients, happy to talk to them at any time, um, free of charge, just to give them uh, an idea on where they might be and what the possibilities might be, obviously in conjunction with talking to yourselves. Yeah, and I think like like us, Will, you're open for business whether you're in the office or not at the moment. So I don't think that things have stopped for you. I know I've probably talked to you as many times as I normally do, if not more in the last few weeks. So things keep grinding on, no matter whether we're in the office or at home. So Business as usual, but yeah. in, in an unusual way, correct. Yeah. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate your yeah, time. Thanks,